we, we then just overextended. We're trying to do everything perfectly and it's impossible. I think yeah. there's, there's the temptation for it to do that, isn't there, when, when things shift. Um, and that's why I think it's been so important to me um, to keep it in mind. I, had, I think if I didn't have that initial reason for, you know, I wanted to share this, this really good information that's usually locked away in the therapy room, I, pro I, I just wasn't me. So it wasn't, it wasn't enough of a pull. You know, I didn't have any interest in being kind of public person, that kind of thing. So it wouldn't have been enough for me to work that hard on it. Um, and it's, yeah, as long as I keep that, that thought or that value in my mind about, you know, sharing knowledge that can help people with their mental health, then, then that enables me to keep going. I think there was a period where it felt like just a grind of work when, um, and not the writing. I loved the writing, but then there was obviously this pressure to keep, you know, putting content out there and I can't just disappear for six months. And, um, and that pressure felt like, but I think that was a symptom of overload of just, okay, I've got to write a book. I've got to be a mum and it's lockdown and we're homeschooling and, and I've got to get video on every day. And, you know, that, that for me, that's a sign of overload. And that in turn influences your motivation in the moment. But I guess I'm aware that motivation is something I can't rely on anyway. It's a feeling and it comes and goes. So some days it will feel like a grind and other days it will feel really exciting, you know, coming to do this and, and meet you. And that, you know, that stuff's kind of really wonderful. And some days, you know, I'm, I'm in my therapy room on my own with a camera going, oh, got to say something profound now, you know, what? <laughs> find something. <laughs> um, so, you know, and I think it's awareness of every job has its ups and downs. I can't rely on feeling like it all the time. I have to remember why I started it and the values behind it to keep me going. Objected to these kind of ideals of everything, aren't we? And, you know, um, for, for parents, there's this kind of um, all of these images about what it means to be the ideal parent, depending on what kind of content you're consuming. And then there's these, these ideas of the ideal business person or the ideal author or the ideal social media you know, whatever. And and because we're subjected to so many of them, we, we then just overextended. We're trying to do everything perfectly and it's impossible. And then we feel terrible and we feel like we're failing or we're at fault rather than um, the culture that says, you can be anything you want to be. You know, actually it's okay to decide this is what I want my life to look like and that's okay. You know, it's just, it's okay for it to be like that. And and for people to have goals that are smaller than others, you know, it's, um, I think it's, it probably leads to a much more psychologically healthy outcome. My barometer is always my family, so my children, and I will only ever do um, as much as I can do while I'm being the mum I want to be. I think, and, and I won't always get that right. And I haven't along the way, there have been times when I thought, no, this is too much. I need to pull back and um, and things like that. So I think, yeah, that's my kind of center point really, because that is, you know, where my core values lie. And that's the most important role I have as far as I'm concerned. And so I guess I will always use that as, as the baseline, you know, is this gonna have a detrimental effect on my family or not? Um, and what can I do within that? When you look at sort of what happens in the therapy room, um, you know, there are people who, when they experience emotion, it's quite unsafe for them because the coping strategies that they've had throughout life have been unsafe or dangerous ones. And so, um, you know, we'll never kind of advise people to just, you know, open the floodgates and allow everything in. It's very sort of careful and, and um, there's a process of gearing people up with the tools and I often talk to people about this when, when they're thinking about going to something like a trauma therapy, right? So um, while that involves going over the trauma, no decent therapist would ever get you to do that without first gearing you up with the tools to be able to cope with the emotion that comes up. So um, for anyone who feels like they, for example, kind of shut down emotionally and, and sort of block it out, you want to open up gradually to things and, and open up gradually to emotions that feel maybe less dangerous or less um, sort of overwhelming in small ways, in supported ways as well, so that you you know you can manage it and, and it's not going to completely um, be overbearing. 
So, but I guess on a kind of day-to-day level, lots of people don't even recognize that they're blocking. They just recognize um, that whenever they've done something at work that's embarrassing and they feel awful, they just go home and crack open the fridge and they're just looking for anything. Or maybe it's go on Netflix for like six hours and, and block out the world or gaming or whatever it is. And and so often it's hidden in the behavior. People will say, yeah, I'm fine with emotion. And, but I smoke 50 a day. And, you know, it's a kind of, you know, what, that's so true. what's the function of this and that and the other? And, and it's always about looking at it with curiosity, not judgment, but curiosity. Why am I doing that? What's the function of that? What's it doing for me? And and often it'll be some level of safety around something that's uncomfortable. But it's really key that there's no judgment there because it's something that we all do. It's it's mm. human. And, and that's because our brains are so brilliant at taking over for us and doing something very quickly on some of the most engaged and ask questions and, um, you know, come up with new topics and, and respond really positively in comments and things. And... And so I think there is a shift in the right direction. And I think I think social media has had a lot to do with that, actually. It's enabled people to start having a conversation that they wouldn't dream of having face-to-face with people. Mm. Um, and certainly I recognise that in when I was just working in my private practice, I I wanted to do it around the family, so I, I couldn't do it all. So I kind of left the NHS and I, I thought I'll just work in like school hours and I'll manage it around that kind of thing. So... Um, I thought I would have to advertise and and I never did. And that's because, well, therapy is a really private thing when you're really struggling. When it works and you get better and then you're doing fine and it finishes and you go off about your life and then you come across someone who's struggling and they go, that really helped me, try that. Mm. And so actually all of my work was based on word of mouth. And, and I think that's happening more and more that people, once they struggle work out a way to get through it then believe in the in the tools that they learned whatever they were they're willing to share that and and because they don't want to see other people go through the same thing and i think that's a bit of the shift of that stigma um that that people are going oh yeah i went through that Mm. or something similar go and try that it really helps even consider it or have access to it for whatever reason um and i think whatever the situation human contact and human connection is is everything if you can find someone that you trust to talk to and even let's say worst case scenario you don't have anyone you can trust to talk to or you feel so awful about this particular situation that you can't bear to talk to anyone write it down just use words use art whatever it is try and get to grips with what what could possibly be going on here start reflecting on experiences not with judgment, but just looking at what's happening, what happens here, what happens before that, what what leads up to it. That's a lot of what happens in therapy, actually, is, you know, people will come in with a feeling, oh, I felt this awful thing. And then and then we'll look at, okay, what led up to that? Let's go back a week and let's work to it. And, and you know, what made you vulnerable to that? And then equally, what came after? What did you do? Did it make things worse? Did it help? A lot of those things that that we end up doing habitually are the things that work instantly. And they're addictive because they work instantly, right? It's going to the fridge or grabbing the wine or whatever it is that, that they're addictive because they give us instant relief, but in the long term they keep us stuck. So they're the things that then get us in that cycle of the next time you have that feeling, you feel even more need for that that safety behavior or that blocking behavior because it worked so quickly last time. And, and actually the things that tend to work in the long term are hardest in the moment, like sitting with it and feeling it and using skills to get yourself through it. Yeah, so I did a video on this recently, actually, where we, if, I don't know what we were thinking, but we used kind of balloons with a tube that went between the balloons. And it had this idea that um, if, if one of those balloons was confidence and the other one was vulnerability, if you're only ever willing to be with your confidence, so if you're only ever willing to be in the situations where you feel confident, um, then you're, it can't grow. It can't, it can't sort of grow beyond that. Let's say um, in the pandemic, being at home, feel, you know, you're confident at home, you feel comfortable at home, but being outside, you feel vulnerable. And so it's really hard to go to the supermarket and it's really hard to go out to a bar with friends now. And if you're not willing to be without that confident feeling that you have when you're at home, 
then your confidence can't grow. It's not going to grow sitting at home. And, and that's where in therapy we talk about, you know, the most important stuff is the stuff you do in between sessions in your real life. Um, and so for anyone, you know, I often say to people, if there's something that, that you really want to master, but it makes you nervous, do it as much as you possibly can in, in manageable doses. Because the thing that you do every day will become your comfort zone. So it will gradually become easier or you'll become more confident at your ability to do it. Um, but your, the way that your brain works is through repetition. So the more you do something, you build up coping strategies for it over time, don't you? The more you do it. Um, it's probably a mix of that and making um, clear choices based on your values rather than your feelings about how much of it you want to have. Um, it's okay to do that sometimes, right? We all do it because we're human. But what happens is a lot of people will come to therapy when they've lost touch with their values for some reason. Maybe life has sort of pulled them in a different direction. And they're not totally aware of that. They're just aware that everything just feels kind of meaningless or I just feel lost and I'm not sure why I don't feel the way I want to. And often when we, when we act based on how we want to feel now or how we don't want to feel now that's that short-term stuff that will keep us stuck in the long term um whereas if you act based on values you can live a life of meaning it won't always be comfortable but it will mean something to you Your emotions get such a bad rap don't they because they kind of um you know we're talking about things like jealousy and people say you know i, I just could never get jealous because it's an awful emotion or something like that and and actually the emotion isn't the thing to judge. The emotion is information. It's your brain's best guess at what might be going on around you. And your brain sometimes gets it right and sometimes gets it wrong. And it's your job to work that out. And so to, to look at emotion with curiosity, like, wow, I'm feeling really envious. What's that about? How can I, you know, how can I work around this and, and work that out? And how do I want to then respond that to that? How if I look back on this really difficult moment in a year's time and I feel proud of how I dealt with it, how would I need to deal with it to feel that way? Not easy to do in the moment because these moments happen quite quickly sometimes. Um, and that's okay to make mistakes and then and then move on. That's probably a different subject, but the emotions get judged. But if we can look at emotions with curiosity instead, which is a lot of what happens in therapy actually, is being able to, to notice whatever's in the room sitting with it, looking at it with curiosity rather than judgment. And um, when we think that the thoughts that pop into our heads say something about who we are, or you know that, that we chose them in some way. And, and that's where this whole kind of, there's a lot of stuff online, isn't there, about you know only positive vibes and only think positive thoughts. And, and if you do that, you're setting yourself up to feel like a failure because it's not the way the human mind works and thoughts will pop into your head. And that's your brain offering up ideas, opinions, judgments, narratives, you know, memories, all that kind of thing. And it's what you do next with it. You know, and, and that's where people can really struggle with intrusive thoughts, for example. So they'll have a thought that feels bizarre to them or feels um, aversive in some way and then judge themselves for having had the thought and try desperately not to have it again. And when you try not to have a thought, you're already having it because you think, don't think about whatever it is. And, and so, you know, you're just setting yourself up to fail if you think, if you're trying to control what thoughts come into your head. But if you allow them all to be there, and then you choose consciously what to do with them next or how much time to spend with each one. Controversy around the the, the idea of self-esteem more recently in the field. And, and you know, self-esteem is based on this idea of it's your sort of evaluation of yourself. And so there was a lot of work done like in schools and stuff years ago around getting kids to think of what they were good at and what they could achieve and and their strengths and what they liked about themselves. And, and you know, high self-esteem can be n lovely in that sense, but it's not always useful depending on what situation you're in. So um, it's not necessarily useful to think, I'm great in a situation where I'm not doing great. You have to be honest with yourself. And so for me, a much um, more helpful way of looking at it is to, to, to look at it in terms of self-compassion. So your self-esteem can be low, but that doesn't mean that, you know, the story is over and, and things are awful for you. 
if you you can have low self-esteem and if you then treat yourself with compassion you're essentially doing what's best for you and my kids are young but let's say i had um you know teenage kids and one of them wasn't doing well in school and so didn't want to get up for school in the morning because they felt like they were just you know a failure at school so maybe their self-esteem around school was low if we went with that then we would say okay well let's leave school then let's 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 have a day off let's let's go with you know um let's indulge this whereas self-compassion or showing compassion to someone in that way would mean okay what's the best thing in this scenario so what's going to be most helpful to you and your future in this is probably working out what's going wrong and getting to school and and tackling the problem right so um so yeah self-esteem can be um a sort of tricky subject really and that people put a lot into it but it's one part of a bigger equation i think <laughs> want to start to feel better about yourself essentially the best way to do that is through action and doing things that f not not kind of flood the system and make you feel really vulnerable but something that feels a challenge but manageable and then you get this little kind of step up and there's something else that's a challenge and manageable and you get this step up but yeah certainly with you know words are powerful but um things like affirmations i talk about in the book about how uh, not to completely throw them out, but to be sure about how you're using affirmations. So if someone already feels lovable and they read an affirmation that says I'm lovable, it, it'll probably make them feel quite good for a minute and they can soak that in and, and enjoy that. And it'll be kind of short-lived impact. If someone has uh, doesn't believe that, if someone has core beliefs that they're not lovable and they're trying to repeat I am lovable, um, it can almost be detrimental because it sets up this internal argument where you, your mind also chips in with the reasons that you're not. Mm. And then you start kind of battling it out in terms of, like, well, but what about this? And what about that? And then, and then you end up having, you know, you're in turmoil. So it can have a detrimental effect if if that person is genuinely really struggling with low self-esteem or low confidence and that kind of thing. So I think affirmations can be more helpful when they're instructional, when they're about, you know, when this do this and it will help you get through this difficult situation like you know sports people use them and stuff like that and um, to help them get through high pressure moments